Good. Thank, thank you, Randy. Before I go on, I want to say I appreciate it. Uh, Sam and all the work he's done, and Pat too. Pat served at dinner many times when she was here. Sam, you were a tremendous blessing to us here at the camp. And I hope you'll always feel it's your home and welcome to come back here anytime. And if you want to stay at night, I'm sure we'll find accommodations for you too. So thank you, Sam, on behalf of all of us at Camp Brotherhood, the wonderful work you've done here, both in the building and cleaning up places and so on. You've been a real blessing to us. Uh, <clears throat> I suppose I am the, <laughs> the senior person here uh, for many rays. Um, my beginning with Camp Brotherhood began about six years after one television. And everything had been going smooth up to that time until one morning I was officiating, I was in the center seat, I was the master of ceremonies uh, that day. And um, so I had two minutes to introduce the program as was the custom and two minutes to wind it up and throw out the questions. So you felt a little power behind you. So after I made my introduction, I gave a question to, I think, wasn't Ro Pastor Rolander, were you here that day? Where, where are you, Pastor Rolander? Yeah, if you remember, you may have been there that day. So I put a question to, to Rabbi, and he started out, and then he banged the table, stop this program, he said. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my God, I've blown it, I've offended the Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> we're off of the air, <laughs> this is the end of the challenge. And they turned off the lights, and the cameramen all looked with their mouths open. What happened? And Rabbi said, I can't hear my, my partners with this carpenter hammering next door. <laughs> and Don McEwen, who is our announcer, was in the corner. And just like that, he said, Rabbi, it seems to me that's not the first time you and your people are trouble with a carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> Were you there that day? <laughs> that, was a fun, <laughs> that was a fantastic day. Because everybody just laughed like you did. The cameramen and the floor directors, everybody, because, you know, for me it was one of the greatest relief moments of my life. <laughs> <laughs> to know that I hadn't offended my dear friend the rabbi. I thought, oh, I've, I've done something awful because I was in charge of the program. But, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here tonight with Rich Lawson. He's across from me at dinner. Rich is an architect. And before Rich works on a building, <clears throat> he has it designed and drawn out to the smallest detail, the stairs and the windows and the doors and everything else. But that's not the way the, ra the rabbi operated on. So one morning after one of these programs, he said to me, what are you doing today? Well, I'm a pastor at St. Patrick's Church in Seattle, and you never say you have nothing to do as a pastor. <laughs> so <laughs> Father Jim, out of defense of the pastors, I said, well, I've got a few things to do. He said, can you drive to Mount Vernon with me? I said, yeah, I guess I can. What's going on in Mount Vernon? He said, I want to buy a farm. <laughs> he said, Rabbi, you know nothing about farming. He said, well, come on, get in the car and I'll explain to you. <laughs> so when I look back on it, just recently I was thinking of this. The critical moments, critical moments you make sometimes <clears throat> without a lot of time to think it through. Because on the way up to Mount Vernon, he said to me, our young people are living in ghettos. They don't know each other. They're just as they did a hundred years ago. And I want to build a place where they can come together, get to know each other, and uh, be prepared to live lives of respect and tolerance for one another in the future, and not all the bigotry we're experiencing or have experienced in the past because of religious affiliation. So I thought it over for a few minutes. I had no idea I'd be ending up here with a $5 million plant some years later, mm -hmm. and a program that's now ready to go worldwide. And I, I said, I was the ambassador, I suppose, for the Catholic faith at the time, being a Catholic representative on TV. So I said, Rabbi, I support you 100%. That's what we're trying to do on television. So he had been looking for a place for a camp for Camp Brotherhood. And he had some of his parishioners or people from the camp looking for a place. And they had located this farm, which was for sale. The couple who lived here were Catholics. And they used to go to church in Mount Vernon. And they came to the stage you couldn't drive. So um, they put it in the market. So we come up, and Rabbi made this beautiful presentation to him. And uh, I remember the owner, he looked at him very solemnly and nodded his head every so often. And then it turned to me, and I seconded the Rabbi's um, presentation. It would be a great place for an interfaith center. Well, you remember, he was 80 years old. He grew up prior to Vatican II, Father Jim. And the idea of Catholics and Protestants and Jews and so on getting together was a novel idea for him. 
And he kind of looked a little, but he, when I spoke, he said, well, it sounds, seems good to me. But he said, it's one problem. It's a man from California has an option on the place next Monday. But if he doesn't take it, you can have it. So I, I remember <laughs> feeling just like a balloon that was deflated coming back home and wondering what would happen. So that was on a Wednesday after we did a TV program. So the following Tuesday, we phoned up here to, to the gentleman, Mr. Goldade was his name, to know what the result was. Well, he said, the gentleman who had the option on the place was on his way up here to complete the papers. And he was in an accident in Portland. He wasn't seriously injured, but he ended up in the hospital. So he called me. <laughs> and I told him that there was a rabbi and a priest inter interested in the place, and he said, give it to them. <laughs> so that's why we're here tonight. I don't know who that gentleman was. I'd like to write, he's probably gone by now, the poor man, but I would love to have written to him and thank him for his offer, because he made it possible, along with Mr. Goldain, and then the friends who helped us to raise $22,000 of the $85,000 we paid for 300 acres here. So we had to sell 100 acres in the meantime. But perhaps that's how we got it started. So uh, I'm going to take another minute or two and then I'll turn it over to Rich Lawson. Um, the idea of the rabbi was that we give some of this property here to the Jews, to the Catholics, to the Lutherans, to the Baptists, to the Methodists, put up their own building, have their own programs, but have some uh, dialogue together, we had through sports, through cultural exchanges, uh, debates, a library, and so on. And that's the way I bought into it. That's what I had in mind when I said, yes, Rabbi, I'll, s I'll support you. So, <clears throat> 1966, we completed a purchase of the place from the f owners in, in November of November 1966. The next important event, day, I don't know whether Justice Smith was there that day or not, it was December 28, 1966. There was a meeting at the Washington Athletic Club, and uh, the Wheelers and Dealers of Seattle was there. Were you there, Justice Smith? That was, <laughs> you know, I have never put this in print, but I think one of these days I should for the sake of the record. So Rabbi and I presented what we had in mind to them. And we asked if they would support this. And um, they all agreed to, you know, Rabbi has this project. I don't know how much it's going to involve, promise, but we'll give it our name. So they voted to approve of it, correct, Justice? Um, so then I was assigned to call on the, the heads of the different churches, you know, who would supposedly support the place the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Baptists. I remember the first one I called him was a Lutheran bishop. I forget his name then. Bishop, <coughs> who was it? Fielman. Fielman, that's right. So he gave me a very courteous reception and so on, but he said, you know, we have a Luther camp. We can't afford to expand. Catholics couldn't afford to expand. The Baptists said they had a, a place up at Buck Creek. They all turned me down. I said, we can't afford it. This was 1967, remember, almost 40 years ago right out of Vatican II, so we'd just come out of the Cold War <laughs> between the churches. And they weren't quite comfortable just fraternizing, I think, I don't know. That's the reason they gave me officially. So here we are with 300 acres and um, no prospects of turning into the use we intended. So the scriptures talk of the, the psalmist, even though I walk through the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you're with me with your rod and your staff to give me courage. When I look back on 1967, I find that's where I was at that year in Rabbi. We were in the dark valley. We didn't know where we were going to go. And Mrs. Levine happened to meet a Professor Choice from the University of Washington. And she told him about this crazy husband and a crazy priest that bought 300 acres and didn't know what to do with it now. He was ready to be sold. Well, he said he was interested in youth work, so he would propose to the seniors at the University of Washington if they would design a building and put it up and he would evaluate them on it. And 14 of them agreed to uh, design the building and put it up here under his direction beginning in January 68. 
And most of you don't remember, January 68 was one of the coldest winters in Seattle. The only other one that was worse was 1950. And during, while they were building it, some of their women, including Julie Lawson, the <coughs> wife of, of, of uh, the, her husband here, the rich, uh, used to come up with meals for them. Julie, you were most kind. You had a play, part to play in this building of, of, of four, uh, the, the lodge here. So thank you very much, and the other wives. But I think now for a moment I'll take a break. I'll turn it over to Rich and his friends who helped to make it possible. Thanks, Father Tracy. <clears throat> what happened while his story is going on, we had a little different story at the University of Washington. <clears throat> there were several of us students who were really tired of taking designs to a certain point and stopping. We never got to take, carry a design into fruition and see what it really would work out like. So we were talking on one side of the fence <clears throat> about finding a project to build. And of course the, uh, the administrators at the University of Washington School of Architecture didn't like that idea at all. They have us out <laughs> swinging a hammer and the liabilities and everything else. But we were pretty pretty strong about what we wanted to do. And then that's when uh, Bob Joyce came and said, I've got a project. And we said, well, what is it? And uh, that's when it started. It was probably one of the greatest experiences anybody could have, especially being a student and uh, taking their fifth year of school and being able to come up and build. So we, we ended up, uh, the 14 of us, after designing the project and submitting it to the building department, getting our, our permit, we would come. We would take two days of the week, Monday and Tuesday, for our classes back in the city, and then we'd come up here and camp out in the farmhouse. We slept on the floor. We brought our noodles and our tuna fish and whatever we ate in those days. And we would. We came up. We 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 walked the sites. We found a place where we figured this has got to be the place for Fisher Hall. We drove the caterpillars, we did the loaders, we, and I, the snow was there. I remember the snow. It was, it was cold. And we lived in that farmhouse, and we would spend the balance of the week here building this building. Uh, graduation time came around the uh, later part of June, and half the people bailed. And there was about six or seven of us who stuck on until uh, we finished the project in August. <coughs> Some of the stories, there's just tons of stories, but um, what one that really comes out is uh, we were building, we were pouring our slab in Fisher Hall. We had this really intricate design of uh, wood slats with the concrete going in, and, and at that time a big fireplace was going to be formed up. Our well ran dry. So we were pouring concrete, we have no water, we were going to expose aggregate everything, brush it all down. <laughs> what do we do? The, the well has run dry. So we call it a septic tank company out of Mount Vernon who mm -hmm. cleans out septic tanks. Well, they had the truck and they pulled up some water from the lake and they came in and they pushed this stuff down on the floor. <laughs> it, was, it was gross. But we're in here scrubbing and we got the, we got the aggregate all exposed on the floor but boy, it was a chore. <laughs> never forget that one. Another story that I just I'll never forget uh, when we were meeting with Rabbi Levine and Father Tracy he was talking about this interchange that he was going to have down on, on I-5, right down at the bottom of the hill, Lake Macquarie. This big interchange, highway interchange. <laughs> Before that, of course, we had to kind of work our way off the highway. And we all kind of laughed. Oh, sure, yeah, you're going to have an interchange. It's an interchange. He was an amazing guy. <laughs> His wife, uh, during the summer when we commuted up here, we commuted every day during the summer, gave, loaned us or gave us her pink... Pontiac station wagon. <laughs> so us He-Man every day rolled up here in this pink station wagon. Of course, never wanted to see anybody that we knew. And every day we back and forth. And, and it was absolutely one of the most fun projects you could ever imagine. I, we, we learned how to build. We learned how to... Uh, in fact, we, one of the uh, students, his father was a master carpenter. And if you've seen Fisher Hall, there's some really weird roof forms over the entry. He could not figure that out. I mean, he's trying to work off his, his framing square, and this is how you do, this is how you lay up the joists and everything. He could not work it out. 
and of course we didn't know any different. We just lay up a string and put it on, and cut it, and put it in. He walked off the job. He got so confused at one time. He said, "I'm out of here." <laughs> he left. But it was just we just really enjoyed the project. Uh, I mean, everybody that finished the project got to see it finished. Uh, turning the key over to uh, Dan Evans to open it up. It was just a great experience. Well, tell us some of the members of the class. One was killed in Vietnam, or the others were not. Uh, one member uh, was killed in Vietnam. Uh, another one had a pretty severe injury in Vietnam. Luckily, uh, myself and, and there was two of us who had already been in the service prior to school, so we, we were lucky. We were the older two, so we kind of ran the show. Um, but a lot of the other guys had to, had to get into the Vietnam situation. Uh, one of the uh, students became a, he was Japanese. He couldn't swing a hammer. He'd come up here and try to work, and it was just it was something really foreign to him. But he's back in Japan now as a very prominent architect in, uh, in uh, Tokyo. Uh, another one of the students who did finish the project out is a very prominent architect in Honolulu and teaches at the University of Honolulu and has a very large firm. And most of the other guys are they're around in various architectural firms right. or on their own. Uh, Meaty and... No, no they, they didn't. No. Yeah? <laughs> they, they work with you? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> there she goes again. <laughs> you can start talking. Yeah, give yeah. me instructions. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Julie. No, you did a good job studying these women. I never met you at that time, but I heard how you brought up the meals to them and kept them, kept them, kept them safe and they slept on the floor in the coldest winter ever came. That's right. We did that. Um, now, one other thing we should have mentioned, before we got to that stage, um, about January of 1967, and I want this to be on the record, the rabbi had selected a group of these people who attended the um, uh, luncheon at the Washington Athletic Club on December 28, 1966, to form a board. Were you on the board just as you were? Were you at the rabbi's house that night? Oh my goodness, you'll be one of the, the only one I have. So, uh, so we, we traveled the road. So the question was, I think at that time we'd, we'd, we had made the decision, found out that the, these other churches wouldn't support us. And would we take Dr. Professor Joyce's offer to put up a building and um, take whoever would come? So there was quite a hesitation on the board, but finally Rabbi said, it's either time to shut up or, or close shop. I always remember it that night. And finally a vote was taken that said, well, go ahead and, uh, and build a lodge. And the money for the lodge came from Como as well as the money for the new uh, Warren building. Elizabeth Warren, where are you? <laughs> Elizabeth, your name should be up here too, along with your husband's, because he, by giving us the time, the television time on Sunday night, a free time at 6.30, he made it all possible. And also, when we're at that crisis, Como helped to come through with the, I think it was $50,000 to get it started. Is that right, Rich? At the time? I, you, you, well, I we just paid the bills, right? But um, tomorrow morning, when I make my presentation to you, I'll be asking you to um, give a two-minute silence to Darby Brown. Remember Darby? Darby was yeah. Darby was the coordinator with you, and he just died a few months ago. I saw that. Yeah. So uh, he was the, he was with Hard Right Construction Company, and he was the coordinator who worked with the students when they were building Camp Brotherhood and. In fact, just less than a year ago, when he was in his 90s, he, he was living in a retirement home in Bellevue. He wanted to come up here, but time didn't work out for me to bring him up, but he still had an interest in the camp. Mm -hmm. So that's how the camp got, got off of the ground. And uh, some of these students came back in the summer of 1968 who weren't in school to finish it. And it was dedicated by Governor Evans in 19, October 1968. And since then, perhaps 120,000 people have gone through uh, Fisher Hall, uh, different ones. So we have taken in, <coughs> we're not in control of the programs that come here, but that's something I hope will be discussed tomorrow, that we will be taking control of going back to the original purpose of the camp, 
is to bring different religious groups together and I will tell you some interesting uh, proposals we have with that regard. But uh, I think I'll turn it over to Justice Smith now to just give us his regard. <laughs> My wife, to whom I've been married for 48 years, loves me very much. But she says that when I talk, I'm a rambling old man. <laughs> and she made me promise that I would not do that uh, this evening to bore the wonderful people who are joining us here this evening. Um, I would like to especially pay tribute to Mrs. Warren. Uh, you may not know it, but I was a news commentator for Channel 4, KOMO, and Bill used to sign my checks. <laughs> <laughs> when we drove up today, despite some visual problems I'm having from some eye surgery, I could not help but feel a sense of great awe as we approached this environment. The sun was shining, the trees are green, the buildings are there, and it was sort of like one of those openings that you see in a visual depiction of the promised land. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, this is what the vision of Father Tracy and Rabbi Levine was. That in this meadow, there would emerge, with the help of the many people who were part of <coughs> it, this wonderful institution, which is of itself a thing of natural beauty, but which has in its promise the location for some of the most faultful interactions between peoples of this generation. How did that come about? Father Tracy makes reference to his coming to see this farm with Rabbi Levine. Rabbi Levine, as you may know, was trained as a lawyer in England uh, before he came to the States, and so he and I had something very much in common arising out of his legal background. I grew up with a special respect for priests, for rabbis, mm -hmm. for nuns, and ministers of various other faiths. And so it was natural for me to be responsive to Rabbi Levine. I was serving in the Seattle Municipal Court and being the brash person that I was, I tried to create innovative programs that were not previously done in courts around the United States. And one of the things that I decided to do was to draw upon resources in the community. One of the persons in the community whom I contacted was Rabbi Levine, the law-trained lawyer from England who was the chief rabbi of Temple of the Hearst Sinai in Seattle. Rabbi Levine became a part of my advisory group for these various programs I had in the municipal court, but one day I got a note from him that he wanted to talk with me. He was sitting in court, and when I recessed court, I had a chance to talk with him, and he then told me of his dream. 
and of his vision for developing a facility where persons of all ages, all groups, and all religions could come together. And he said to me, would you meet me in Mount Vernon on Sunday at 2 o'clock? <laughs> I told my wife, who absolutely adored him, as did I, she decided she would come with me. We came out here to this farmland and it was raining cats and dogs. <laughs> Rabbi Levine, unfettered, no umbrellas, had us sloshing in the mud. <laughs> in the farm mud, <laughs> walking around as he was telling my wife and me what he had in mind. And I thought to myself, this man is crazy. <laughs> but I loved him so much I could not say he was insane. He was just crazy. <laughs> But as he talked and expressed his vision, it became more apparent to me that it made sense. Even though it was raining cats and dogs, and even though we were sloshing in the mud in farmland up to our ankles in the rain, that was the beginning of my understanding of what this was all about. And as Father Tracy has indicated, we had meetings, pre-board meetings, board meetings. Rabbi Levine had the capacity to persuade, partly because he was a brilliant scholar and rabbi, but partly also because of his legal training. All he would have to do would be to find somebody like me, tell me what he wanted me to do, and I would do it. <laughs> but in those days, Rabbi Levine knew all the executives of all the major companies in Seattle. In the old days, we refer to them as CEOs with a great deal of pride. <laughs> and so we had the CEOs of KOMO, of uh, Washington Natural Gas, of Philadelphia Electric Company. And I could go down the line as I was looking at the names of people who were listed as participating in the development of Camp Brotherhood, and I thought to myself, here was a man who, with his ecumenical companion, uh, the Reverend Father William Tracy, was able to persuade people to see the vision they both had and to help to make it a reality. This ability to persuade went to the University of Washington. It brought these wonderful uh, students from the university to help in the development of uh, this uh, the first structure. Uh, Father mentioned Darby Brown. As names are mentioned, my mind is going back to all these years to all the wonderful people that I had the privilege of knowing through Father Trace and through Rabbi Levine in connection with Camp Brotherhood. Nat Rogers, Bob Rogers is here, his father was among them. And uh, if I went down the list, I could give you the names of 50 people who were what could then be called movers and shakers mm -hmm. in our community, who were significant in helping us to develop this magnificent facility, which we now are enjoying and will continue 
to enjoy in the future. We used to have meetings, and again, I'm not sure at what point we established a board. Uh, rather, the meeting in the Washington Athletic Club or the meeting in the Levine's home on Cascadia Avenue in Seattle. And those of you who knew the Levine's, you knew that Reba Levine was a professional artist. And uh, she would have her artwork, and she was short, but she was also a magnificent cook. And we would like to have our meetings at the Levine uh, residence because we could always be assured that we would have magnificent food prepared by Reba Levine. <laughs> and it was part of that environment where the rabbi, Father Tracy, the other people sitting around the table were talking about what could be done, what should be done, I don't think anybody ever said something could not be done. And the spirit was always optimistic. This is the vision. This is the reality. This is what is possible. Even though we talked about it, and even though Rabbi Levine talked about it, and Father Tracy talked about it, and Reva Levine, I seem to recall, actually depicted uh, what this would be like on one of her paintings. None of us could have contemplated that 35 years later, we would be sitting where we are now, that we would have had a reception in the William Warren building, that we would have the magnificence of these 200 acres of previous wet farm lands, which is an oasis in our world, which is an inviting place where people can gather <coughs> and where persons, whoever they happen to be, women and men, children and adults, older people, younger people, religionists, non-religionists, persons of the various faiths, and I'm a Protestant, I'm an American Baptist. But it makes no difference. I enjoy the interchange of ideas, philosophies, religious history, and our present existence with persons regardless of their religious professions, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of who they are. And I have dreams, but I am not qualified to have visions. I leave visions to the Father Traces among us mm -hmm. and the Rabbi Levines among us. But I have dreams. Dreams are momentary. They come and they go. But my dream is that my grandchildren will have the benefit of what has been started here to the point at which they can look back and say, my grandfather was part of this when it was nothing but a farm land in the rainy weather, in the mud, <laughs> and look where we are today. <clears throat> and that is my dream. I would like to see it accomplished during my lifetime. Uh, I am 76 years of age. I do not know uh, what my uh, lifetime will be. I predicted 20 more years. Mm -hmm. uh, so I expect to be around at least until I'm 96. So I've come back on the board after an absence of a number of years. And if I am not expelled from the board, <laughs> I expect to work very hard to help to bring not only the vision of Father Tracy and Rabbi Levine into fruition, 
but the dream of Charlie Smith. Thank you. Thank you very much. You mentioned uh, Nat Rogers was one of the pioneers uh, who gave his. Uh, Nat Rogers was one of the pioneers, a great businessman in Seattle, Van Waters and Rogers. He may have seen the name in the trucks. I did uh, before I ever met Nat. So um, he was a good friend of rabbis, and uh, uh, he also um, kept up an interest in it and communicated that faith he had in Camp Brotherhood to his son Bob, who was chairman of our board for about 30 years. So uh, was it more than 30 years? Anyhow, Bob. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you. Uh, I've got two or three thoughts. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Just go ahead and clip that. Uh, <laughs> clip that, Bob. First, first of all, I like to stand up when I'm talking. First of all, clip it on. Oh, you want that on? Clip it on. Clip it on. You clip it on your nose? Yeah. Or? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Paul and I started here at the same time, right? 25 years? Yeah. I think that's right. And uh, that's number one. Number two <clears throat> is I have never before uh, had this experience, which I ask your sympathy for, uh, of following a s Supreme Court justice <laughs> at, the, at the bar. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> bear with me. Uh, I think the uh, thing that I want to tell you, though, about my history in this is that uh, I went to Garfield High School in Seattle. <clears throat> in those days, Garfield was known as the melting pot of Seattle. My mother wouldn't let my sister go to Garfield because they had a whole bunch of people who weren't white and, what do they, what do they call them? <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> why, yeah, those kind. Uh, and uh, so, but my dad prevailed and uh, let the two boys go to Garfield. So that worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. I played football on the 1941 football team for Garfield, uh, which had a history of winning football games, and in particular the Seattle Championship. And that year was no different. They turned out 16 letters for that team, and on that team there were 14 different ethnic or national histories involved in those 16 guys. And I knew right then that <laughs> if you could get that kind of a group together at the right time, under the right circumstances, they would work together and they'd be winners. And I think that's one of the things I'd like to see this operation foster because we need it badly. And Jamal and I have discussed this. And uh, who else was in that discussion? Father Tracy. Uh, we need the interaction. And we need the understanding. And so I'll leave it at that. And thank you. Oh, one thing I forgot. Still hooked up. This cane was made by Rabbi Levine. And it was given to my father. He made one for me, which has disappeared, because I put it on a plaque and gave it to Rita, and then she died. Very, very uh, inconsiderate, I would say. And uh, at that point, the cane and the plaque and the whole works disappeared, and I've never seen it again. So I'm using my dad's cane made by the rabbi. You know, it says, he truly lives who has learned how to serve. Oh. Oh. Bob, we might have found the answer for you tonight. I got a call just before I come over here from uh, Mrs. Levine's son, David, and his mail was late getting to him, Randy. So he was in Bellingham. He didn't think, is he here? thought he might come down late tonight, so he might have the answer to where the cane went. But um, that about concludes the presentation of those of us who are the, the pioneers. But if any mayor. mayor has to say, Mayor has been here. He dropped nails right from the very beginning. So, Mayor, you take over. 
nice to not be a pioneer. <laughs> it, ages, it ages you. Uh, Bob, Bob and I did attend uh, Garfield High at the same time, and I... I graduated. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I think I did. I got into university somehow. <laughs> but... Uh, my involvement came early. My dad and my and uh, Rabbi Levine were great friends. Uh, uh, rabbi Levine uh, had moved from England to become a rabbi after he was an attorney, and went to Lithuania. And my dad's family came from the same city that that Rabbi Levine went to. So they had a lot in common. And he used to come over and play chess with my dad, and I'd sit there next to him and watch. Uh, and uh, once in a while I'd try to kibitz and get in trouble, but uh, the two of them would play chess by the hour. And uh, so later when I was in Temple, I, I became Temple uh, D. Hirsch's uh, uh, president of the, of the men's club. About the time that this dream of Rabbi and Fathers came together, and uh, Rabbi came down and uh, said, you know, Mayor, the men's club, needs to be involved in a lot of different things. And I said, you're absolutely right. We're, we're trying to do ushering, and we're doing all kinds of things for the temple. And he said, well, you know, I think it's about time that we did something that was more community-minded. And so he said, I've got an idea. So he said, why don't you get a bunch of the guys together and the men together and get a truck, and uh, uh, next Sunday would be a good time to do it. <laughs> and uh, he says, you can organize it, can't you? And he says, oh, well, I said, well, <laughs> you don't say no to rabbi. Uh, yes, we can, we can do this. And so we got about eight or nine of us together. And next thing we knew, I, uh, he gave me a piece of paper with instructions where, to drive, where the truck should be driven to. And we had a heck of a time. The interchange wasn't there. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, we came out here, and the weather wasn't great, that's for sure. And, um, but we finally made it, and uh, we got here, and uh, Rick would remember me, and I think th those days, was, there was a bite. <laughs> was, and they signed us as carpenters. You know, just like Father Tracy was talking about uh, Jewish carpenters, and that's where we should be a carpenter. <laughs> well, to make a long story short, we end up hitting our nails, which are, and, and more than any other nails. So uh, Rick and his crew decided that we should go, <laughs> we should go out and clear the brush that had to be taken. And so we, we were, became swampers for about two or three different weekends out here. And so that was my initiation to the program here. And, but Father Rabbi Levine was, uh, after my dad passed away, he became almost like a father. And, and I, like so many of uh, the people that came in contact with Rabbi, uh, he became a mentor. And there's nothing he could ask for or thought about. It wasn't it? Was real important. I was fortunate enough that uh, Father Tracy uh, uh, and later on came into Stanwood, and we became for seven years, I think it was. We had breakfast every Saturday morning and kept. Thanks to that theme. And uh, his Jewish mother, as he calls her. Uh, but uh, we really um, uh, we had a great deal of enjoyment together and, uh, and talking over the things that Rabbi did and what he did and so forth. And just uniquely, it isn't part of the aging process of this, but we, Father and I both, and I think I've mentioned it before, and it's, it's, uh, we happen to be the last people, I guess, that, uh, to be with Rabbi. We uh, accidentally both went to Seattle and were uh, on, a, on a weekday, I forget what day it was, but... It was Sunday. It was it Sunday? I thought it was a weekday. Anyhow, we, we both came from different ends of the hospital, walking down the hallway, and we met at his door, and there was no nurse out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the, she wasn't at the, at the uh, station, so uh, Rabbi uh, Father Tracy says, let's, let's go in. I said, no, private and so forth, don't. And he said, but when, when Father Tracy says, don't go, go in, you don't pay attention to signs, you just do it, just like with rabbis. So we went in, and Father took his one hand on one side of the bed, Rabbi was comatose, and uh, I had the other hand, and it's, uh, well, by the time we left there, we, said, we both said prayers, and we got outside, and he said, uh, Father Tracy said to me, 
uh, what did you feel? I said, well, I felt the rabbi told me that we better do something about Camp Brotherhood. And he said, that's the same feeling I got. <laughs> rabbi, Father Tracy put his arm around me and said, we're going to make it work. And that was, the la that was one of the last times we, we were together. And it's been so wonderful uh, to have the uh, vision and dream. And we're so grateful to have Rabbi, uh, Father Tracy here with us uh, today to, to, to start the dream. And the gentleman here at the table has spoken so eloquently uh, to have them part of, uh, of seeing what has happened. Uh, emotions and feelings and sensi sensi uh, sensitivities uh, can't be put into words. I can only say that this is one of our proudest days. And we know we'll have many, many more, but this is a great one for all of us here. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to conclude by acknowledging a few people who have been especially helpful as volunteers. Jim Transnick from Bellevue and uh, Bill, uh, who's... Uh, Wright. Bill Wright, yeah. Mm -hmm. You went to stand up and, and we recognize both of you come up here and spent many hours of work. Thank you very much. <laughs> but to all who have helped here and uh, will continue to make this a great center of light for the future and human beings and divided in so many issues. I'm very happy to have Jamal Rahman, a uh, Muslim from Bangladesh here with us and especially tonight as the news reports how we're expecting attacks in six different countries from Muslim extremists and we need to get together and share our, our viewpoints. I'd like to conclude. Do you have any other message? I ask you give a question as we leave. I will. I give a, um, a little concluding story about the benefits of ecumenism interfaith work, but there's also some dangers to go with it. I like to tell this story anyhow as a possible, <laughs> a possible danger, a minor one. We got an award from um, the Methodist, Good News Award for our program challenge. It won a national award from the National Conference of Christians and Jews. But this one from the Methodist was to be awarded to us at their annual meeting at Pacific, um, where did they meet in university? Pacific. What's the Methodist University in Pacific? Cell Pacific. 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 No, not Cell Pacific. Pacific Sound, was not it? Or? Future Sound. Future Sound. Sound University. Excuse me. Thank you. So we're to be over there at 6 o'clock. So a rabbi said to me, uh, I said I would drive him. So um, I'm not just at 7 o'clock, I guess. So I said I'd be there at 6 o'clock to pick him up. So right at 6 o'clock, rang the doorbell. And uh, Reba came down and she's all fussed. She says, I'm not ready. And Rabbi is late from the synagogue. She says, uh, sit down and make yourself at home. Here's the paper. I've got to finish getting ready and so on. So I'm inside looking at the Seattle Times and the doorbell rings. And I thought, now what should I do? <laughs> should I be ecumenical? <laughs> <laughs> should I answer the doorbell or should I wait? And I said, well, maybe Rabbi forgot his keys, whatever. So I opened the door. And this gentleman said, good evening. I said, good evening. He said, um, I'm the Fuller Brush Man. <laughs> no. So it's like, good evening. He says, is the wife at home? So I thought, now how am I going to answer that one? <laughs> I said, no, Mrs. Levine is not available right now. Uh, that, that was a good legal answer, don't you think, Justice? <laughs> but he said, she wants this brush for her some little thing for her range and so I promised her she'd have it for Saturday. She was having some friend guests in. Well he said, I guess I'll come back tomorrow. Well I said, Mrs. Levine won't be here tomorrow. <laughs> but I knew she went to the synagogue. And um, oh, well I'll have to wait until Monday. So I looked at the thing, how much does that cost her? It's less than five dollars. I said, I, here, here's a five dollars. So you won't have to come back. I'm sure I leave it here for her. She'd be glad to get it. So he took the five dollars from me. He walked down the four steps from the door there in Cascade Avenue. You walked on Justice. We got to the bottom. He turned around with this really worried look on his face. And he said, aren't you that fellow that's on the te television with the rabbit? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what are you paying bills for her for? <laughs> <laughs> so that's just one of the dangers of this. <laughs>
minor danger. But anyhow, <laughs> we come to the end of a wonderful evening. So I'd like to conclude with just a brief prayer. Almighty God, whether we're created by the Big Bang, however you created us, we believe we are your children. That you call us to live in peace and harmony with each other. I recall the first meeting we had here of Methodists, Catholic Christians, and Jews, and Muslims. I went home and I watched the most beautiful sunset in my life. And I believe you spoke to me that night. There was the end of hostility and the beginning of new relationships of which Camp Brother could be a part. For being part of this program, I profoundly thank you and give thanks for all who helped in making it a reality. May your peace and your joy be with them. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm. One final thought. You've got to recognize that the challenge program was a real success when the Fuller Brush men recognized the people. <laughs> <laughs>